The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. The wind was blowing really hard. Stranded on a mountain. The conditions were deteriorating really quickly. Two friends are trapped in an ice cave. You couldn't roll over, you couldn't raise your knee. While a blizzard tried to bury them alive. We created our own avalanche on ourselves. Their story of survival. They were gonna come up there and collect bodies. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. China is threatening to retaliate after President Trump said he would impose new tariffs on their imports. It's the latest exchange in the trade battles between the two biggest economies in the world. And the question many people are asking is, how will this affect my pocketbook? Jennifer Wishon brings us the story from Washington. Experts say more tariffs on Chinese goods means Americans could pay more for a variety of products, from toys to smartphones. But President Trump says it's time, once and for all, to stop the Chinese theft of American jobs. We've taken the toughest ever action to stand up to China's trade abuse. Starting September 1st, he's putting 10% tariffs on the remaining 300 billion in Chinese imports he hasn't taxed already. For many years, China has been taking out hundreds of billions of dollars a year and rebuilding China. It's time that we rebuild our country. China is threatening necessary countermeasures. Its foreign minister today saying imposing tariffs is definitely not the right way to resolve trade frictions. But the president says China isn't acting fast enough as the world's largest economies work to reach a trade deal. He accuses Beijing of failing to stop the sale of fentanyl to the U.S. and not following through on promises to buy large amounts of American soybeans. <laughs> The new tariffs are on top of an existing 25% tax on $250 billion in Chinese goods. China retaliated to that move by taxing $110 billion in U.S. goods, dealing a blow to U.S. farmers. But this new round of tariffs will affect a range of consumer products, from clothing to electronics. The president says Chinese negotiators are trying to wait out his term in the White House. They're praying. They would like to see a new president in a year and a half so they could continue to rip off the United States. In Congress, he has some support from both parties. I think President Trump was on to something when he talked about China. China has been abusing the economic system for a long time. And while she disagrees with the president's tactics, Senator Elizabeth Warren tweeting, we absolutely must be tough on China. By setting this latest round of tariffs at 10 percent, the president is leaving himself room to ratchet them up higher if necessary to put more pressure on China. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Well, there's a much longer perspective here. You know, how did we get here? And, and the reason we got here is that uh, numerous administrations, and you can go back decades on this, uh, took advantage of the import of cheaper goods from China, the lower wage cost of producing those goods, in order to keep inflation in check here in the United States. And so if you could uh, satisfy the American consumer with low price goods, then uh, everything was going to be great. At the same time, you had uh, a loss, a huge loss, in terms of jobs, in terms of pro uh, production capacity, here in the United States, where it became much better to uh, produce within China. Uh, so I applaud the president for finally looking at this and saying there's been an outflow of uh, several trillion dollars. It's not just billions, but trillions to support the Chinese economy at a trade imbalance that's been there for a very long period of time. So he's finally uh, bringing it into check. So what's it mean for you and me? Well, in the short term, it's going to mean higher prices at, at stores for a variety of things. There are now tariffs on every single import from China. Uh, then on the other side, there's going to be tariffs imposed by the Chinese uh, primarily on our agriculture. So um, you're going to see farmers uh, in need. And, and what's, what's going to be the ultimate price if you can't sell to the largest market in the world for agricultural products? Well, uh, what, is, what is that going to mean?
Uh, stock market's going to gyrate over this, uh, already has, and so you're going to see up and down based on what are the tariffs going to do to future investment because that's the ultimate cost of a tariff. It, in, it in introduces uncertainty into capital markets because you can't price your goods. You don't know what the ultimate cost is going to be, the ultimate price. And so if you're a manufacturer and you're saying, do I want to build a new plant in China? The answer today is no, I don't want to do that. Uh, and so where do you go with your capital? What do you do and, and how do you price goods in the market? That uncertainty is going to cause people to not take risk. That has an ultimate impact. And in economic history, one of the triggers for the Great Depression was not just the stock market crash, it was then the tariffs that were imposed, uh, and that shut down world trade. So uh, he's playing a, a game, uh, and it's a, it's a negotiation, and these are hardball negotiating pra practices by President Trump. On the other side, the Chinese are also playing a game, and I think they've been playing it ever since he imposed the first uh, round of tariffs. And what they're saying is, uh, well, we're very patient, and we can wait for a new president, and we're pretty confident that new president won't impose tariffs on us. So is that going to be 2020, or is that <laughs> going to be 2024? Uh, they're very patient, and they will play a waiting game. In other news, several evangelical leaders have written to the president asking him to expand America's refugee resettlement program. Ephraim Graham has that story from the CBN newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, the leaders from some of the largest evangelical denominations are worried about the future of the refugee program. They say the U.S. can deal with illegal immigration while still accepting legal refugees. Heather Sells brings us that story. The president has supported religious freedom in many ways, both at home and abroad, since he first took office. But now some key evangelical leaders are concerned that he might end the U.S. refugee program, which welcomes persecuted Christians and other religious minorities. Pastor Sam Rodriguez oversees 40,000 Hispanic churches and is one of the president's faith advisors. He's urging Trump to differentiate between illegal immigration and the plight of refugees. Refugees are those vetted by the U.S. and found to have a credible fear of persecution. They most often come to the U.S. from refugee camps in Southeast Asia, the Middle East, and Africa. We could do both. We could stop illegal immigration but continue to provide a safe haven via the conduit of our refugee settlement programs for those that are seeking legally to come into this country and are fleeing persecution. A recent report in Politico revealed that the Trump administration may end the U.S. refugee program. In response, Rodriguez and leaders of some of the largest evangelical denominations wrote the president, we pray you will reject any advice to shut the refugee resettlement program down and that your administration will not merely continue the program at its current, vastly reduced level. The leaders want it restored to its historic levels of 75,000 or more. Last year, the Trump administration cut the program by a third to 30,000. There have been fewer and fewer uh, refugees uh, arriving to the area. Pastor K.J. Hill oversees volunteers who work with refugees at the Summit Church in Durham, North Carolina. Their numbers have slowed this past year, and he's concerned about the possibility of the program ending. It would be uh, disappointing for sure. Um, we take seriously uh, the command of Jesus to, to love our neighbor, especially the vulnerable and the marginalized. Last year, after evangelicals publicly opposed the administration's family separation policy, the White House reversed course. On refugees, their opinions are a bit more mixed. A 2018 Pew poll found that only one in four white evangelicals see a U.S. responsibility to accept refugees. But Wheaton College's Ed Stetzer thinks that they and other people of faith might convince the White House to change course once again. A lot of people are saying, well, maybe this is not the best course of action. And we've seen this before. We saw this with family separation. We are what the Statue of Liberty, the adage on the Statue of Liberty, we are that nation. We're both full of conviction and compassion. And, and I would advise the president to please, as a Christian evangelical leader who believes in the rule of law, but likewise compassion, 
please revisit this. The White House must decide by October 1st, the new fiscal year, how many refugees, if any, it will accept. Heather Sells, CBN News. Family and friends gathered in the Regent University Chapel Thursday to honor the longtime co-host of the 700 Club, Ben Kinchlow. He died last month at the age of 82. Mark Martin brings us this look at the touching tribute. Some of you, if you're expecting a funeral today, you're in the wrong place because today we're going to celebrate the life and legacy of Ben Kinsler. Regent University's pastor Mark Lawrence set the scene for the celebration service with the flag-draped casket of Ben Kinslow before him. In addition to being a veteran, the man of God served as a minister, author, businessman, and well-known 700 Club co-host with Dr. Pat Robertson. It's Ben's homecoming, and brother, I just want to tell you, I'm looking down at this casket. We love you. I loved you. We were great together. You were my dear friend. We were partners, and we lived for the Lord. And you, your life is a testimony to the power of God Almighty. Thank you, Ben. We love you. God bless you. Thank you. A light has not gone out because Ben has gone on to eternity, because the legacy that he has left uh, shines in Nigel, in Levi, in Sean, in the grandchildren who are here today. That was the greatest gift to me that he gave me. Freedom to ask questions without fear of being shut down, without retribution of going, you can't, you can't think like that. That's not how it goes. The freedom to explore to keep finding the truth. The service was also a time to celebrate the humor of Kinchlow. So one day I'm walking down the hallway and here he comes. I'd seen him on television. And he stopped and looked and said, you are a man of God. I said, whoa, thank you very much. <laughs> Why are you saying that? He said, because you wear boots. <laughs> Throughout the celebration of life service, speakers remembered Kinchlow's love for Jesus Christ and his passion for sharing that love. You can say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. He'll change your life. And if you will understand Ben Kinchlow, you cannot simply see him as a broadcaster. You cannot simply see him uh, as, uh, as a CBN man, even though he was all of those things. But you must recognize that Ben Kinchlow is a man that God found in the midst of bondage and brought him out of that bondage. And when God brought him out, he gave him a voice that has changed our lives. This is definitely a homegoing celebration. I will miss him and the flesh not being able to pick up that phone and hear that strong, thunderous voice and the great accolades, but he has run his race and he has already preached his own funeral by his life, by his giving, by him pouring into souls and saving souls through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Mark Martin, CBN News, Virginia Beach. What a life. Grew up watching him. It was certainly an honor to have met him. Gordon. Oh, and one of the untold stories of Ben Kinchlow is he was a groundbreaker. Uh, he broke through a color barrier on daily television. And you look at the life story. Here's a, a man who's raised in a Christian home, goes into the Air Force, serves his country, comes back into a very segregated Texas, and it makes him angry. And so he starts listening to the teachings of Malcolm X, and he starts to say, well, I agree with that, and he, he gets angry, and uh, he, he starts advocating, okay, if you're going to mess with me, I'm going to mess right back with you. But then God got a hold of him, and he became a great witness of what could happen. And so who does God pick him to pair, pair with? Well, the son of a Democratic senator who was part of the, my, my grandfather, part of the whole massive resistance to, de to desegregation in the South. And so the two of them get together in the early 1970s. And, and go back to the 1960s and you look at the race riots, you look at uh, the struggles of Martin Luther King Jr. And, and you, you go, how could all this happen? And here comes Ben Kinchlow on a daily program uh, holding hands with a white man and saying, let's pray together and let's pray to Jesus. What a great testimony of what can happen 
with the cross, how we're all together. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave, free, male or female. We're all one in Christ. What a great witness for our culture. Uh, ben Kinslow, a true groundbreaker, uh, one who led the way for so many of what can happen when you come to the cross. Well, you can watch our memorial service for Ben Kinslow. All you have to do is go to CBN.com. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, forecasters predict a near normal hurricane season this year. And that's of little comfort to those in the Florida panhandle who were crippled by a Category 5 hurricane that ripped through the coastline last year. Caitlin Burke covered that storm and recently went back to investigate recovery efforts. What she found didn't look much different from the disaster zone she left. This area of coastline along the Florida Panhandle is known as the Forgotten Coast, seen as one of the last remaining stretches of unspoiled Gulf Coast beaches. But in 2018, Hurricane Michael ripped through this region as a Category 5 hurricane. And residents here say it gave their nickname as the Forgotten Coast a whole new meaning. It seems like people just forgot us here. I mean, even my neighbors that we all used to be really good friends, and it seems like since the storm and we fell on the hard times, nobody even talks to us anymore. Can't make appointments to the doctor's offices because they're out of business. You know, trees down still everywhere. That's what's so depressing is that you don't feel like you're progressing. Right now, every day is a work day, literally. People just can't find enough workers to help. So there's really not a day to plan vacations and holidays. Lori June and her husband had a home in Mexico Beach. It was completely ripped off its foundation by Hurricane Michael, landing hundreds of feet away. They lost everything. I remember when we cut onto 36th Street and the house was gone. I just, that was the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. It was pain and it was complete fear. What do we do? But we're here and we're alive. The Junes decided to stay on Mexico Beach, but they couldn't find a home to rent, so they improvised. Welcome to my savings account, <laughs> literally. This is our 24 foot camper. This is our home that consists of me and my husband, three dogs and two cats. So uh, um, it gets pretty cramped, but it's home. We walked these streets with search and rescue crews last year, the day after Hurricane Michael hit. And honestly, not much has changed. People are living in what is still a disaster zone. 80% of our city was destroyed. So coming back is gonna be a slow process. Oh, well, I mean, to date, eight months in counting, we have no grocery store, we have no gas station, we have no bank. Pretty basic amenities of when you think of a city. Throughout the panhandle, we heard the same stories. Residents trying to process all they've lost and homes, hospitals, and businesses sitting just as Michael left them. That's the case for Lighthouse Church in Panama City Beach. It took a direct hit from Hurricane Michael, losing the roof of its sanctuary. We toured that wreckage last year after the storm. Today, it sits in the same condition. Instead of focusing on their building, Lighthouse Church has focused on its people. We've made so many connections outside of our community, uh, through the, like I said, through the kingdom. We've connected to churches and cultures all around the state, uh, bringing and pulling in resources and really trying to push that, those resources and that love of Christ into the community. Because before you can rebuild a building, you have to rebuild the people. If we can instill the hope and the hunger and the passion in the people, the buildings will fly up but it starts with making sure that that person knows that they're loved, that they matter. Uh, and we do that through our connections. Even as the church works to provide hope, you can't help but wonder what's the holdup in recovery efforts. It's multifaceted, but ultimately comes down to funding. FEMA is offering a reimbursement program, but towns like Mexico Beach can't afford to pay for recovery up front and then send in a receipt. This town has a budget of three point five million dollar annual budget. 
Our debris bill alone is over $60 million. Residents face battles with insurance and mortgage companies. Plus, there's the disaster funding package. It was delayed for seven months as President Trump and Democrats bickered over efforts to add money towards Puerto Rico's continued recovery from Hurricane Maria and the border. By the time the federal funding passed, the 2019 hurricane season had already begun. To be honest with you, it never crossed my mind that it was hurricane season. I mean, look at us. We're still crippled. We're still barren. We're very vulnerable. And there's not anything we can do about it. As residents here continue to dig out and make do, they wonder when help will come or if their coast really has been forgotten. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Mexico Beach, Florida. Well, it's a horrible problem. And you, you look at all the, the facets of it uh, when you have this kind of disaster hit and and people say, well, there's no hope of re rebuilding, then, then they leave. And then businesses take a look at that and say, well, we can't be open anymore. So it creates this downward spiral where if you don't have the basic businesses you need to form a community, well, then what's going to keep people there? And so uh, the folks that are left, the reason they're there is they can't move. Uh, they don't have the funds to do that. And then you look at a municipality that doesn't even have the, the money to get into the FEMA system. Uh, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, th does there need to be action at the state level? Yes. Does there need to be action at the federal yet level? Yes. Uh, I became aware of the situation. We had Operation Blessing down there in the aftermath of the storm. And then, uh, you know, you, you look at deployment rates and how long are your people in the field and you pull them back out. Well, we're going back in there because they're people that need help. Uh, they need their homes rebuilt. They need their lives rebuilt. So uh, we've got the team there now, and we're looking to do even more. If you'd like to help with that effort, you can call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can also write to us, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. 23463, just put Operation Blessing Disaster Relief in the memo line of a check. Or you can go to our website at CBN.com. Either way, do it now. Let's be part of the solution, not just say, well, there we got a huge problem. Let's say, how can we be part of the solution? 1 800 700 7000. Terry? It'd be wonderful to see a follow up story in a little while, wouldn't it, on how this is Oh, we're going to have it soon. <laughs> Great. Love that. Well, up next, two hikers are caught in a blizzard, and rescue crews said it was too dangerous to try to rescue them. There's no way they could know anything about our position or the state of how we were or if anybody was hurt. Find out how they made it down the mountain when we return. Well, 14,000 feet up Mount Rainier, Mark and Brad were stuck. The two adventurers, adventurers had begun their descent when they ran into a freak blizzard. Well, soon they were alone in an icy cave with winds whipping around them, frostbite setting in, and no one out there able to help. Mark Duggan and his friend Brad Davidson were trapped in a snow cave on Mount Rainier in Washington. Just seven hours earlier, they were climbing up with no problems at all. The weather was clear when we left. Everything was gorgeous. Um, it was picture perfect. Starting at Paradise Trailhead, they hiked to Camp Muir at 10,080 feet, where they made camp for two days. The third day, the two climbed to the summit and took a few photos before heading back down the mountain. That's when the weather took a drastic turn. The wind was blowing really hard. Uh, you couldn't see, I mean, your visibility was maybe 30, 30 feet or something, the conditions were deteriorating really quickly. As experienced climbers, Mark and Brad had food, water, and survival gear to get them through the storm. But they only brought enough provisions for three days. Seven, eight minutes of this, and I'm like, Brad, we've got to start digging a hole because if this storm lets up, great. We'll go down in an hour if it lets up. But if this sets in on us and stays here, we got to get out. We can't stay in this uh, weather. So at that point, then we started uh, looking for a spot to build us, dig a snow cave, and then we started digging. The storm didn't give up, and they dug for seven hours in blizzard conditions. 
They were now trapped in the ice cave at an elevation of 14,100 feet. You couldn't roll over, you couldn't raise your knee, you couldn't move your arm. I mean, it was just this, but it kept us alive. But I do remember that evening uh, that we just pray for wisdom, that we would know the next thing to do, that we would act decisively and with intention. That night, they decided to activate Mark's distress beacon. It's not going to a cell signal, it definitely is going to a satellite. But when you push it, no, you have no idea if anybody is getting it. The signal was received and Mark and Brad's families were notified by the park rangers. They also learned conditions were too dangerous to send out a search party. Mark's wife, Julie, was staying with her parents when she got the call. I was extremely shocked. You don't ever expect something to go wrong or happen. And there just were no answers at that time, just speculation about what it could be. During the night, Brad got out once an hour to remove the snow and ice the storm was dumping on the makeshift cover of their cave. I was really concerned about the weight of that just kind of caving in on us and we would either die of suffocation in our sleep because there's no airflow coming in or it would basically, basically collapse on us and we create our own avalanche on ourselves. For the next two days, the only thing anyone could do was wait and pray. I prayed a lot about breathing because of altitude sickness, which turned out to be really incredible because that was a very difficult thing for Mark in that tight space. The other thing that I remember we prayed was just for our families, that they would just kind of have uh, peace because there's no way they could know anything about our position or the state of how we were or if anybody was hurt. Julie asked a friend to get the message out to pray. Sound the alarm was all that I had said to her. And she texts back, I already have. There were so many people praying. You know, I had had that fear of everyone's going to bed. And we actually had a team of people we knew in Uganda at the time. And I remember at midnight emailing uh, one of the people on the team because I thought, oh, they're getting up. They're wide awake. They will, they will pray through the night. The weather finally cleared. Mark and Brad had been trapped for three days and frostbite had begun to set in when they started the climb back down to base camp. 45 minutes later, the two friends saw a welcome sight. A rescue chopper was coming their way. They were gonna come up there and collect bodies and then to find us up moving down the mountain was joy for them because they were like, this is good, you know? We're gonna get some live people off this mountain today. It was overwhelming, I guess, in some, because you just live through these days of uh, just exhaustion and everything's just changed. Meanwhile, Julie was flying in from Tennessee. During the flight, she felt like God was telling her everything would be okay. The plane landed and the texts were uh, flooding in. And one of the very first things I saw was a picture of Mark and his dad. And I was like, he's so okay. <laughs> he's so okay, you know? Because even though my, I had felt the Lord saying, that day to me, that that was the day of his glory. And in my heart, that meant he would be rescued. I couldn't imagine he would be that okay. Dehydrated, hungry, and suffering mild frostbite, Mark and Brad were flown to a Seattle hospital. There, Julie and others from both families came, overjoyed to be safe with those they loved. It was just smiles <laughs> as wide as you can imagine, and uh, just, great, great joy to be together. I mean, it wasn't like they just drove for 30 minutes in their car. I mean, they flew halfway, they flew across the country um, to come and just be there uh, with us. Mark still loves to climb when he's not home with Julie and their two children. Looking back at his time on Mount Rainier, Mark is thankful for how God protected and provided for himself and his friend. We dug this hole in the ground for seven hours and we both had shovels like this. Uh, that we use to dig and, and there's two pins here this lower pin holds it while you're using it and it worked the whole time for seven hours but when i got down off the mountain when i looked at the shovel and tried to extend it uh, the tab here was broken and it's no explanation for how that is broken but it functioned the whole time so for me personally i look at this and just it's one of those miraculous moments and i i look at this now and it's just a reminder 
um, of what I see as God's faithfulness. He's also thankful for how God answered the many prayers of friends and family. The Lord was faithful in giving us the wisdom of what to be about and what to do to stay alive, and then to give peace to our families and to our kids and just his watch care over them and just his, his kindness when we were, you know, up on the mountain, it was really evident uh, to us. God is wonderful. He watches over us. You know, he sends his angels to protect us. He, he cares. He numbers the very hairs on our head. He, he knows and he, he sees, he understands, he feels all that we're going through. And we're of great concern to him. And he loves to provide miracles for his children. Now, three weeks ago, we asked for prayer for the head of CBN Cambodia. His name is Paseth. And if we can get the picture of him in the hospital three weeks ago, that's him in a medically induced coma. And what is going on is that he had a recurring fungal infection. Uh, he thought he was cleared. He went back into Cambodia came down with it again, and apparently somehow dengue fever was involved, and it came back with a vengeance. But there he is in the worst, and uh, let me spell it out. If you get any kind of medical background, his platelet level fell to four, uh, and he was absolutely dependent for four days on transfusions in order to keep himself alive. Well, a week after we prayed on this show, uh, amazing things happened, and his platelet level went to 27,000, and the doctors who were predicting his death were now predicting his life. Well, here we are today, and we've got another picture of Paseth. There's him with his wife. He's out of the hospital, and he is fully recovered. No impact from all of this. Uh, I mean, to go from the shadow of death to now the picture of health it's an absolute miracle, and I think his platelet levels are back up to 250,000. So it's just an absolute miracle. And we thank you for praying for those who were concerned and prayed. Thank you. Your prayer was heard and answered. A great circle of prayer was created, and God raised him out of a deathbed. That is a miracle. The doctors say it's a miracle. We all say it's a miracle. So praise God. God, he's still in the miracle working business. Now we're going to pray for you. And if you need a miracle, let these stories encourage you. Here against all odds, they were expecting to pick up bodies from that mountain and they found two people trying to climb down. For Paseth, the doctors were expecting him to die moment by moment. And for four days, he clung to life and all the doctors were saying, well, he's going to die. They literally gave the family no hope at all. But God gave them hope. So have hope today. And here's another miracle. Here's Luan from, from Kansas. She had anxiety after the death of her father. She thought it was a never-ending pattern. She couldn't break free from it. And then she was watching the 700 Club. Terry had a word of knowledge and said, put your hand on your chest and believe God for deliverance. Well, Luann felt the darkness lift she has not had another panic attack since that day. And so what a wonderful thing to go from a never-ending pattern of panic attacks to uh, now being free. Yay, God. The one the sun sets free, right? Well, Natea lives in Margate, Florida. She suffered with severe dental issues. She was in such extreme pain she couldn't chew or eat. One day she was watching this program, and Gordon, you mentioned her problems problem specifically. She knew the word was for her, so she claimed it. Her pain and discomfort vanished. She was so happy to call the prayer center to let us know about her complete healing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He numbers the hairs on your head. He numbers your teeth. He numbers everything. Uh, he looks at everything. He's concerned about everything. If you're anxious, if you're having panic attacks, your Heavenly Father doesn't want you to do that anymore. If you're dying on a mountaintop, he wants to protect you. He wants to surround you with his love. If you're in a hospital in Malaysia dying from a fungal infection, he's there with you. And he wants to save. He wants to heal. He wants to deliver. All we have to do, and that's all we have to do, believe. 
So right now, in an act of faith, believing, lay your hand on that area of the body that needs healing. Terry and I will agree with you, and we're going to let God do all the rest. Lord, we lift those who have needs in the audience right now, and as they are laying hands on that area of the body that needs healing, and if it's throughout their body, we're laying hands on their head. If they can't move their hands to lay hands, we just ask that you lay your hands on them, Lord God. Reach out and touch and perform miracles today, Lord. Thank you, God. For your miracle has already occurred. And it occurred 2,000 years ago that by your stripes, we were healed and we are healed today. So we receive your sacrifice. We receive what you have already accomplished. We receive what you have already done. And we receive it into our bodies now and we give you thanks and praise for healing today. We thank you for what you are doing and for who you are. Uh, there's someone, a man named Timothy, you're laying your hands on your left knee and God has just healed your knee. And what you couldn't do before, you just felt all the pain just literally drain out uh, through the, your lower leg and out the bottom of your foot. All that pain's just now gone. And you're able to support your weight on it. Um, do what you couldn't do before. Put weight on that left knee and realize that God has completely healed you. Terry? Now, someone else, your right ear, you, you felt it. It just suddenly opened. It's, you were hearing through it, but in a really, um, almost like a, a, a an echoing hallway. God has opened that up for you. Now your hearing is perfectly clear. You'll not have problems again. Some of the scalp condition that's uh, acts like psoriasis and it's primarily on the back of your head. Uh, and God is just an embarrassment. You're not even praying for it. Uh, God is just healing you and he's restoring your skin and, and all of that flaking, all that problem has left you and it's never going to return again. In Jesus name, be healed, be set free from that. Yeah, and someone else, you have digestive problems. It has something to do with the lining of your stomach. You, you understand what that is, but you're just going to feel a warmth uh, in your upper, the upper portion of your torso as God heals that completely for you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your healing touch. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank that you have become our deliverer. Thank our you. salvation is all from you. It's not based on anything we have done. It's based all on what you have already accomplished. We thank you for it, and we receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Send us your good report by calling us 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. We're here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All you have to do is call us. It's our honor, our privilege to pray for you. So 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, the epic story of man versus God now being told in a brand new novel. Author Brennan McPherson takes us inside his latest page-turning, Babel, when we come back. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. The Pentagon is preparing to withdraw troops from Afghanistan as part of a peace deal with the Taliban. The agreement will require the Taliban to negotiate a peace deal directly with the Afghan government and to guarantee the country will not be a launch pad for international terrorist activity. Some U.S. officials have concerns about how to keep the group accountable. The Washington Post reports if the deal is finalized, troops would be reduced by nearly 6,000. CBN's Operation Blessing is empowering women in rural Honduras. Many women living in the deep Honduran countryside have little ac access to resources to provide for their families. But Operation Blessing volunteers held a special training designed to teach these women new skills. They learned how to hand make jewelry that they can sell in their market. Now these women have a practical means to earn and provide for their families. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by going to its website, ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club is coming up right after this. Brandon McPherson started writing stories while he was a junior in college. 
Now he's released the third book in his Fall of Man series, and he's given a new spin to a classic story that's been told for thousands of years. When Brennan McPherson was a young boy, he was always intrigued by stories in the Bible. Brennan now combines his fascination with scripture and powerful storytelling skills to inspire others to read the Bible for themselves. His popular Fall of Man series of novels first featured Cain, followed by Blood. His latest, Babel, once again brings the pages of Genesis to life. Well, we are back with Brennan McPherson, and we thank you for joining us on the program again. Thank you. So Babel is the latest one. You know, it's a short story in Scripture. What what made you decide to grab hold of that? It's a fascinating story. Yeah, yeah. It's a short <laughs> one, but it's such a big event in human history. And the thing that made me uh, realize there's a story here is recognizing that Noah was actually alive during the events of the Tower of Babel. So the question was, what was he doing while his his whole family was rebelling against God because Noah was a prophet of God. Yeah, it was, I mean, it's, it really caused me as I was reading it to think about, you know, sometimes you can read scripture and everything is so consolidated into mm -hmm. short verses and descriptions of things. And as you've gone into all of this, you really think about how rough life was then. I mean, it was just a, a different time, a different world, people probably thinking differently. How do you prep your brain for all of that. <laughs> well, a lot of it is just imagining, uh, you know, how life is today, because the thing that you find is humanity has been the same for so long and culture changes, but you just try and imagine the inputs and how would I react to this situation? So how did you, in thinking about Noah, I mean, that's another story as we know, mm -hmm. and then Babel, how did you figure out how to pull those two things into a simultaneous happening? Well, um, we, we know the last we hear about Noah, he's getting drunk in his vineyard. And then uh, his son ridicules him and the family's fractured. Yeah. We don't hear anything more about him, but we know from the, the scripture genealogies that he was alive during the events of the Tower of Babel. So uh, directly leading into the story of the Tower of Babel is that episode, that last mm -hmm. episode. And so it makes it clear that these events are connected. And so I wanted to explore what is the connection between these events. Yeah. It's kind of amazing to me, um, and I thought about this as I was reading your account, how easily we fall away from God's provision. Yeah. Uh, and what was the most difficult part of, of writing this account? Because you're really telling, you got multiple things going on. I guess that's a novel in general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, um, yeah, just really delving deep into my own uh, heart issues, how easy it is to uh, stop being diligent in my own pursuit of Christ, my own pursuit of love for God, um, because it is, it is easy to forget and to, to not be diligent. You have the father-son theme running through all of the books that you have written. What, what's the, the focus of that in your books? The focus of that really, uh, in the, the Fall of Man series is, is all around the theme of failed fathers, because the truth is there's no perfect father this side of heaven. Right. So the question is, can we love each other and forgive each other and heal together despite that? Yeah. So it, it explores, even in this book, you know, a, a bad abusive father, a good father who made mistakes, and then a, a, another father who was bad, but then was repentant. Mm -hmm. And all of those different nuances. It's interesting, isn't it, with the fact that so often the absence of a father or a father who is acting inappropriately impacts a family, that God would choose to label himself as our father. Absolutely. And, you know, broken families, missing fathers is an absolute huge issue in our world today. So many of the people who go to prison had an absent father. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really a tragedy. You're a father now. I am a father. <laughs> and it's been a sobering experience. <laughs> I had someone say that to me in my family the other day who doesn't have children yet. And she just said, you know, we're both scared. I said, and well, you should be. <laughs> yeah, because it is terrifying, the responsibility the, of having a really, soul. They yeah. totally rely on you. Yeah. So how did becoming a father impact your writing this book? Really, it, be, uh, it became much more self-reflective mm -hmm. rather than reflective on other fathers that I knew. I really thought a lot about, man, how difficult it is to be present all the time with your child, to n never harm them with your words, 
to always uh, be building them up mm -hmm. and uh, to be the spiritual leader, really. And that's the, the theme of this book is <laughs> yeah. Noah wasn't being the spiritual leader. Yeah. And it's kind of the projection of my fears of if I wasn't, if I wasn't faithful. Yeah. How about the relationship that you had with your dad? How did that play into all of this theme? You, you know, I'm lucky because I'm convinced my dad is one of the best dads in the world. Um, and he would do anything for any of his kids. He would, he would give up anything. And, you know, because of that, he worked really hard when I was young. And um, that did have an impact on me. And I didn't even realize it until I was older. Yeah. I remember coming back from college one time and just feeling emotional and not really knowing why. And I just said, Dad, I, I just need you right now. And he just wrapped his arms around me and, um, you know, just said, I love I'm you, here. son. Yeah. I'm here. Wherever you want to go, we'll go. Whatever you want to do, let's do it. And, and that was so healing for me. Well, it says a lot about your dad that the door was open for you to oh, say that. <laughs> 100%. He's an yeah. incredible person. Yeah. So Babel was this story. What's next? I, I know that you must have another one in your yeah. brain. <laughs> yep. So next in the series is Abram, but I'm also doing kind of a prequel uh, book on Adam. So uh, wow. beginning with the, his creation in the garden and moving on through the fall and the events with Cain. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of thought and time and effort go, go into these books. Babel is the latest, the story of the tower and the rebellion of man, and it's available now. You can find out how to get a copy by going to cbn.com. Brendan, always great to see you. Thank you. We'll look forward to, to Abram. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Nellie is a young girl living in Honduras. One day she became so sick, she thought she was going to die. And when her father found out what made her sick, he and their whole village were terrified. For years, people in this village in Honduras had only one source of water, an underground hose fed by a pool a mile up the road. The pool is filled by water seeping through the soil. Adults and children were getting sick from drinking it. All families suffered from it. We did not know it was bad water. What people didn't realize about the water they were drinking is that it had passed through a cemetery filled with 300 mostly shallow graves. For us, it was a terrible discovery that the drinking water ran across the graves. It really scared us. We were afraid of the deadly sicknesses the family could get. Then Pablo's 10-year-old daughter, Nelly, got ill. My stomach hurt so bad, and I was vomiting too. I thought I was going to die. When Operation Blessing met Pablo, we confirmed by lab tests that there was a lot of bacteria, including E. coli, in the water. So we found a new source of water for the community, far from the cemetery. We ran pipes to a holding tank, and there purified the water. I opened the water faucet and began to drink clean water. I was very happy when I saw the water flow into the glass. We have peace of mind now, because the children in our family are not sick anymore. Recently, we went back to visit Pablo's family, gave them a Bible, and shared the gospel. They prayed to become Christians. When he brought the Bible and prayed with me, I felt something special in my heart. Now I read the Bible with my family every day. Thanks to Operation Blessing for this act of love and for helping my family. You can be a part of it. You can be a part of changing a whole village to bring life to them, life-giving water as opposed to death-giving water which is what they had. It's transformative what can happen. And it's because people like you care enough to give to say, yes, let's be a part of the solution. If that's you, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. A portion of every gift goes into the work of Operation Blessing. Another portion goes into the work of CBN International, and you're a part of all of it when you join.
Now, when you call, make sure you ask for Pledge Express. That's electronic monthly giving. The bank is doing all the work. There are no checks to write, and we can send Power for Life monthly teaching CDs to you. And as a special premium for joining, uh, we'll also send you the plan. It's a DVD teaching from my father, Eight Keys to Understanding God's Will for Your Life. So if you want them both, ask for Pledge Express when you call. Do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Well, we got some time for some email. We do. This one comes from Kathy Gordon, who says, I've been a Christian for a long time, but I still have no idea what God's plan for my life is. How can I be sure that God still even has a plan for my life? Well, look to the scriptures. You say you've been a Christian for a long time. Look to the scriptures, and the scriptures will give you great encouragement. The scriptures will tell you what to do on a daily basis. The scriptures will tell you what to do on a monthly basis. They'll tell you what to do on a yearly basis. Uh, and you can find lots of plan and purpose. Uh, we're always looking for some big download from, from God, tell me all the things that I'm going to do. He doesn't do it that way. Um, I think the primary reason is we won't believe it. But here's a scripture for you, and it's from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. So be encouraged with that. God has a plan for you, and it's to give you hope. It's to give you a future trust in that plan. We have a, another word for you from Psalms 20. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. God bless you. We'll see you next week.